Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to my temporal uh, blue team village weather studio. <laughs> um, in the next 30 minutes, I'll be sharing with you uh, what we all thought would happen in 2021. Every year, and more specifically, the beginning of each year, a lot of companies publish their understanding of what they believe will happen in the upcoming 12 months. Uh, this includes vendors, consultancy firms, etc. And today I'm going to share with you what happens if you do a meta analysis on all these understandings, verified against the present, and a personal outlook for the second half of 2021. I've been doing these analysis for a long time. Uh, yet mostly for clients to support them in either their security program, develop their threat management capability, or create threat scenarios um, for them to actually test. Now, for me, this has been uh, very useful, and uh, I basically take all this published content uh, and actually think about how I can make better assessments on using new upcoming virtual risk or threat scenarios. So that being said, you know, Let's let's dive into it a bit more. So, when we doing the, when doing this analysis, uh, three main elements came up. The first one is there. You know, there's all sorts of forecasts and predictions each year, but is it any good? Is it on point? The second thing I actually thought of was when folks create these products, how are they created? And more importantly, how can these products influence our thinking about risk and threats to our organization? Thirdly, um, are there any surprises? Well, let me be clear. No. There are no surprises in specific themes or topics. What was interesting, though, is how publishers delivered and emphasized everything. We will dive into these three data. The goal of this exercise is basically, first of all, change the norm folks have to do threat predictions, and second, for the right uh, in-house teams, some guidance on how they can deal with this. Now, before we get into those details, just an example, and mostly because things are shown in front of us. That's what we know, that's what we care about, that's what we uh, think about. And if you have, for example, if you have certain network telemetry, but lack like host-based telemetry, then your view and priority will mostly be dictated by that. This then translates into budget and eventually can lead to you having a limited understanding of other risks or areas of risks that are outside of your viewpoint. And I will refer to this metaphor a couple times throughout the presentation. Now, first of all, I would like to introduce you to the concept of forecasting. Technically speaking, forecasting is a process of making predictions based on past and present data, and most commonly by analysis of trends. Now, prediction is something else. It's basically the process of estimating outcomes of unseen data, and forecasting is just a sub-discipline of prediction. But why would you bother about forecasting since we all have thousands of things to do right now? Well, this goes a long way to help you shape your response strategy in the face of an uncertain future. An example could be uh, being prepared for specific ransomware trends or preemptively uh, checking your supply chain. It will help you answer not just you know, the why and the how and the what questions, but it will also help you uh, shape the answers to the when question. Finally, there's also the concept of super forecasting. And this comes from a great study performed by Philip E. Tetlock and various others. And simply said, they had a lot of people do forecasts on specific questions. And there are some people that excel, basically performing better than a random selection, AKA a dark throwing chimp. And he explained, explored uh, why. Now there are multiple interesting pieces to the study, um, besides the monkey, of course, one of the outcomes was that the average of everyone's forecast was generally true. And this inspired me to do a little experiment on what everyone thought that would happen in 2021. So once you think about an experiment, you also think about the analytical techniques. Uh, and it's, base, it's important to understand the basics of forecasting analysis. Basically, you have two types, a qualitative and a quantitative type. Quantitative breaks into time series and causal models, where time series are trend lines we all recognize, and causal models represent complex, complex models uh, for which, for example, compute uh, 
which compute where rain is going to fall. Now, a qualitative approach emphasizes the human telling what's up. And this is what we're going to be focusing on. So the experiment. So if you're interested in the details, reach out to me uh, through the contact details on the last page. Happy to discuss this. Um, the essence of what I did was uh, I grabbed all the threat prediction threat landscapes I could find through all the sources in Q1 2021. I did the same thing for Q2. I analyzed it based on recent events and assessed what direction the next half 2021 will take. And full disclosure, uh, there was so much to unpack and, and too much to unpack that I basically kept it to the most impactful components. Now, let's get into some of the details. All right, broken it down into four main topics, publishers, document, themes, and topics. First of all, uh, I looked into 44 unique pieces. Uh, that's documents and articles. And it's important to note that I found four that were actually released before 2021, and I excluded them from the upcoming contents and slides you will see. Most of them were reports published in Q1, and the highest release moments were January and April. And of the total, 67% was a report, and the remainder online articles, all of them accumulating to a whopping 1,100 pages. Smallest was two pages, the biggest one, 22. And with an average of 27.5 pages per document. It was a lot of documents, a lot of pages. Some interesting things that popped up on my end, um, only 10% incorporated MITRE's attack framework. This actually told me something about how actionable a certain report or vendor actually is, or at least the content they produce. 20% of that includes explicit forecast. And this usually tells me what are the parties that are looking ahead and thinking about the future. 45% use proprietary telemetry, uh, as far as I could actually dig up, um, and the remainder basically applied expert analysis. Finally, 49% uh, of all the, the, con the documents and uh, articles I reviewed uh, build their piece with explicit company and service marketing. Now, when comparing all these documents, it seems like publishers sometimes have an identity crisis. Most of the content is used as marketing, and sometimes they want to actually a full-fledged research paper. You know, in essence, this is also visible in the average structure. They differ across all documents. With pros and cons to various topics one can add in. Just breaking them down. First of all, you know, um, everybody understands that these kind of products are actually marketing, and this is okay. But just remember to keep your threat landscape factual. Keep marketing separate from any produced intelligence value. I'd like to hear your take, not your pitch. The second observation focuses on creativity. More creativity can be put in structuring your messaging. It doesn't have to be the, the good old academic paper approach. And a great example of that is the Verizon's DBR, where data is at large and tone of voice is at times comical. And this makes reading a joy, in my opinion. And, for, and obviously also incorporate timestamps in your documents. White papers and blogs without dates and citation info makes it very difficult for researchers to track that. Thirdly, machine readable text. Structured text versus unstructured text. Well, this is actually an uncharted territory for most. And examples of that could be the area of attack framework or sticks enabled uh, document structures. This is actually one of the areas I'm looking into to develop that further. And I, to be honest, I haven't figured out the answer quite yet myself. Finally, use of forecasting language. Most companies look back, but one do look forward. ISF's Threat Horizon report is an excellent example how one can do this. I believe this is the area where you see the most differences in themes and topics and, mature, uh, and the maturity of the threat intelligence teams. Another element, obviously, uh, of mature threat intelligence teams 
is that they will also do a recap of their anticipatory statements to continuously improve and adjust, which gives, in my opinion, them massive strict creds. And the final tip uh, ties into the last point as well. <clears throat> so first of all, it's good to mention that I made the distinction when diving into the content uh, between themes and topics. The themes are more or less overarching concepts, the topics are, well, topics. Um, the dominant themes give no surprises. All of them are on point per the first half check. We've all seen them, by the way, I think. The outlier themes, uh, or the themes that are not as vocal as others, that's where the differences were. An example is IoT. That was certainly a thing, combined with botnets and DDoS. One thing I actually missed this year was the hardware and processor discussions, for example. In addition to that, macOS security is not a theme as well uh, that is being vocalized of. And the same goes for 5G and artificial intelligence. Both concepts, which are regularly in the news, but not yet manifested itself in the mainstream yet. <coughs> Now, if we look into specific topics, the five most referenced topics, mostly in in front of us, are ransomware phishing, the supply chain, vulnerabilities, and DDoS. Let's take a quick look into all of them. And before I start, um, same as a weather forecast, I'm looking at the moment of Q1 uh, as the reporting on Monday. Uh, our check today is Wednesday, and the end of the year is Saturday. Now, Saturday is my personal analysis as cyber weatherman for the next half based on the check done today. Obviously, this will come to no one as a surprise. We had major ransomware incidents globally, and in addition, we saw an increase to take down the big players. Um, biggest change to me was that ransomware finally became a topic of geopolitics. Now, for the rest of the year, I, I believe we will witness a small activity drop over the summer. Um, following the, uh, the legislative uh, um, crackdown. <laughs> and actors will pop it back up in Q4 once the new status quo has been established and they know what they can and can do. There's two evolutions in techniques and procedures I'm anticipating, uh, one being victim pressuring. This could, for example, be double extortion, uh, social media naming and shaming, and DDoS, all designed to pressure victims into paying more and faster. Second thing, uh, which is actually something that has been done in the last 20 years, and that was the ability for malware to evade defenses. And I think this we can surely expect this to still be the case. Um, one pro tip I'd like to highlight here is uh, the, the use of the so-called SIS keyboard layouts. And these reference languages of the former sovereign Soviet states basically off limits to most eastern uh, europe based groups once malware hits pcs with these layouts it doesn't detonate and there's actually a fun article from brian krebs uh, that, where he explains this concept and obviously tying back to my forecast in good fashion of the evolution of defensive evasion we will then probably see malware creators start integrating time and look at triangulation number two was social engineering through phishing and what we like to call business evil compromise, BEC. Phishing subjects have always been what is trending at the point in time. And for now, it's COVID and cryptocurrency. Who knows what's next? Uh, I mean, this has been pretty consistent for the first half, and it will probably be so for the next half. We saw vendors responding to new trends faster. Uh, an example for that is the use of these fishy Microsoft authentication emails. That was actually quickly shut down by additional authentication methods. Despite it all, uh, macro enabled documents and zip files uh, consistently state the main source of problems. Uh, and I believe we will not see a phishing drop. It is just too effective and we will become, uh, it will just become more and more refined. In addition, I also believe that cross medium integrations will occur. Uh, for example, pretexting through something like WhatsApp. Finally, um, specifically for business email compromise, 
the tactics are expected to be become a bit more sophisticated. Um, for example, targeting group mailboxes to construct changes of payment details. And I think it's safe to say that ransomware and, bis and uh, phishing and slash business email compromise are still the industry's two biggest problems. I'm always surprised actually about this one, um, the supply chain compromise, uh, and especially about folks referencing supply chain compromises as something new. This technique was around when I was in diapers and it will probably exist until I'm not there anymore. Most interestingly, uh, major service providers got hit in the first half and cloud providers have been at the crosshairs continuously. That being said, we haven't seen any, uh, uh, the latest, uh, we, we haven't seen the latest uh, of, of this big instance. This will continue to happen. Um, and I'm expecting this to also appeal to the geopolitical theater. Now, one element that actually doesn't get a lot of attention is the non-technical aspect of gaining initial access. You really don't need a comprehensive targeting program when you can just coerce people into clicking a link, uh, right? By paying them or threatening them. Nothing sophisticated about that. Let's see if we see some more on that. Vulnerabilities, right? When it rains, it pours. And this is unfortunately the same for our friends at Microsoft. When his vulnerabilities dominated the last six months uh, with the exclusion of some VPN, uh, basically anything remote uh, work centric vulnerabilities. The essence appears to reside in vulnerabilities in older versions of Windows which are then weaponized in modern versions. And this will most likely not change. All this media attention, however, does deflect from security of other voices like Mac OS, uh, Linux, et cetera. Another big thing to keep an eye out on is the new Chinese regulation for vulnerability disclosure. Just putting it out there, um, this regulation forces Chinese researchers to first share vulnerabilities with the MSS with all consequences you can think of. This is a very, uh, in my opinion, uh, concerning development uh, for our friendly Chinese vulnerability researchers. And finally, we have DDoS. To me, DDoS came actually as a surprise when analyzing uh, the keywords of all the, as part of the meta analysis. But the conclusion today is quite simple. This is still a valid technique in the arsenal of failures. The pandemic and the role of cloud services needed for work have made us vulnerable to peak flooding. And remember that time when Slack was down? Oh boy. I'm going out on a limb here and forecast that we will see more than 10 million DDoS attacks this year. And I'm expecting uh, new innovations that will lead to more effective targeting. Thus, you know, tech being more refined. And at this point in time, DDoS extortion, for example, is not the well machine that it, is, that it could be, but I can imagine people can do that. So that being said, these are the five topics uh, which are most referenced. And what happens if you take all top fives, threes, et cetera, and put that in a chart, then you get something like this, what you see on screen. Basically what everyone is thinking in a chronological order. There's a couple of interesting highlights. The first one is that initial access is consistent with the main topics we identify, phishing, supply chain, so vulnerability exploitation. The second is that once inside droppers, take care of dropping additional malware. This could be info stealers, trojans, or ransomware. The third one is that ransomware is more often deployed at the end of the compromise. When the Trojans are in place, the actions on objectives have been fulfilled. For example, exfiltrating that confidential information. And the fourth is the crackdown of law enforcement that is also clearly visible in this overview. And my compliments go out to all the people working day at night to stop this misery. Now, what makes these kind of overviews useful, in my opinion, is that you can leverage this understanding to prepare a circuitic program. So are we sufficiently equipped to combat uh, remote access trojans? Yes, so let's check that. Another example could be, how well equipped are we to identify the fan favorite cobalt strike activity? Let me know what you think about this. 
Now there's a couple of themes and, and topics uh, you, you should be monitoring, which are not, let's say, in front of everyone. First one is, is that risk is great. And everybody says the overall risk is becoming greater every year. I'm seeing this every year. I think this is bullshit. Uh, they're just movements. Challenge every vendor that tells you this. So for example, the overdominance of ransomware and phishing articles, does that actually align with real world activity? In this case, I, it probably does, but the point is to do the work. Sometimes folks need a fresh angle, which they didn't think of. Another theme is the evolution of crimeware, especially the business behind that. So imagine this, you know, the, these are the kids that were growing up in the zeros. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are the kids that are growing up through the zeros um, who otherwise could have been successful internet entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, they now took the dark route. And I think this commoditization of cybercrime drives profit and attracts talent. So we're, you know, I'm expecting nations to you know, further collaborate, join forces, share resources to target common enemies, uh, also considering victim vetting and service modularity. I even heard somebody say the dirty word, an apex threat actor. Oh boy. Now run for a treat, right? Another element uh, to consider is the role of Western bias in our third landscapes. Primary adversaries are China, Iran, Russia, and North Korea. Well, the East says, no, it's US, it's Israel. And the reality is that most countries actually have developed powerful capabilities, not to mention foreign versus domestic actor groups. Now we also have the macOS based threats. And in the next half, we might even see the development of the first ever malware to take advantage of Linux visualization streamlined on Mac computers running Apple Silicon and the Big Sur. You, who knows? And finally, we have another big one is the Windows high ground. And what I'm, what I'm saying, trying to say with that is the dominance of the Windows ter terrain has a big impact on everyone for that landscape, mostly the Windows uh, user base. And that drives security research, obviously, into new attack factors in that uh, majority. And that's also demonstrated by the recent exchange vulnerabilities. But also the new features uh, announced related to Android signal some interesting discussions. Now, if we have some specific topics uh, to, to, to monitor, one, the first one could be um, the focus on the old. We mentioned earlier that the research that goes into old versions of Windows, and this is a big thing. Another big thing, yet simple, is attack web applications. But rather, these are simple attacks that apply a small number of steps or additional actions after the initial web application compromise. For extortion, we can expect a continued emphasis on durable extortion attacks. You know, this is a low cost effort with moderate high return. Basically a criminal su sweet spot, and it could tie into DDoS, it could tie into ransomware. We could see it everywhere. The third one is DNS-focused attacks. You know, even our phone book should be considered. One example can be DNS over HTTPS as a tech factor. Everybody's talking about that for years. And even influencing DNS is the thing for years. And for some reason, this is pushed again. And I'm actually curious if this is part of one of the trends I've been seeing in recent years, that actors move back to the perimeter because hosts are sufficiently locked down. Now, in terms of uh, browser injection, uh, malware code has become more flexible than ever and is able to reach further into the attack surface. One malware campaign can have a wide focus across different device and platform. A specific malware, for example, um, controlling hundreds of thousands of domain uh, and the malware itself performs browser injection in order to seed malicious search results in a browser once it is affected. And once you load a malicious DLL extension, it's essentially game over. And what people don't realize is that a lot of edge devices is also a browser, right? Finally, we have wire driving. Uh, yeah, you know, the, th the topic we talked about five to 10 years ago. Well, right now it never been so easy. And commoditization has spurred solutions that simplify this process. And what is interesting is that you don't have to build it yourself anymore. Yes, I know this is what everyone does. 
Um, but it evolved from just Wi-Fi to also Bluetooth. So traditional skimmers get an upgrade that allows for more effective collection of some sensitive information. Probably see something more on that. So next steps on my side. First of all, I will do this exercise again by the end of the year. It will be interesting to compare what people put out there and if they saw the lessons of this talk. <laughs> and I will explore more automatic analysis of reports. Maybe me and some friends will help up the old algorithm. Who knows? And it would be really cool if we can get to some sort of machine readable format. I'm thinking JSON, sticks, uh, tagging, something like that. And this would allow for more uh, comparison and making everyone's precious time more effective. Finally, I'm also a big fan of scenario creation and, and more importantly, testing of that and, and to determine the actual risk. And I'm anticipating that the industry can also play its part in enabling this test, this scenario philosophy. And one good example is Verizon DVR, which includes some specific scenarios which folks can look into. So concluding, the average of what everyone thought was on point. Hypothesis, check. And for the in-house teams, I have three main takeaways. One is that basic security hygiene obviously combats pre-compromise behavior. Prepare for the post-compromise behavior. And thirdly, report on forecasting, however you can. More specifically, what you expect to happen soon, what is happening right now, and what do you think about the gap between the two. What about the vendors? Well, I want to challenge all the vendors uh, to think more in terms of creativity. We will hate you. We will not hate you for trying something new, innovative and fail. Uh, what, what people just don't like is complimentary marketing briefings. Um, people re will reach out to you either way. And finally, and most importantly, make actual forecasts instead of the easy topic X will be going trending soon. Uh, don't be that dart throwing infosec chin. Well, special thanks uh, to the folks who helped me create this presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was my pleasure to speak at the Blue Team Village. To wrap it up, uh, my contact details are listed here. Uh, and if you're up for custom weather forecasts, we just wanna hang out, reach out. Also, the reports reviewed in this research are uploaded to my GitHub. The link can be found individual. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.